Well, riots are raging throughout France and now Switzerland and Belgium. By some counts, there are over 300 fires on public roads in these areas, 300 burned vehicles, uh, 34 burned buildings, 45,000 police deployed, many of them injured, hundreds of arrests. Uh, This all spawned from a 17-year-old Muslim boy last week with an extensive criminal background who was pulled over and fatally shot by police. The video went viral and prompted protests and riots and all kinds of civil destruction that we're watching now. So I wanted to invite political analyst Ralph Schulheimer on to discuss this issue because it is a charged one. It's one that we don't want to reduce to anyone's fault, but figure out what's going on here. And is there any fix for something like this? Ralph, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, So can you give us a sense of what is going on at this hour and why? I know I gave you sort of a simplistic, like the spark in the machine, but what is this showing us about Western civilization and specifically France? No, I think you gave a very good description and maybe just for the viewers and listeners to put it even more into context, the number you mentioned, which is absolutely correct, right? Uh, There were 45,000 French policemen in action. And just to give a comparison to this, this is about the same number of troops the United States had in Iraq after 2011. So this is a significant number, right? I think very often this number is kind of like thrown out there as if it's nothing remarkable. Uh, If the government has to mobilize what is more or less three and a half infantry divisions to keep domestic calm, that's a major thing. So because there's a kind of this this narrative forming that, well, it happens in some areas, in some suburbs, but overall, it's not a big deal. This is a very big deal. And the other thing we have to look at is there is the other narrative that says this is generally a problem with, with migration and integration. And that's partially correct. But unfortunately, and this is what you also think correctly said, the, the harder thing to talk about, it is about specific immigration groups. To give you just one quick example, right? There are 500,000 Jews living in, in France. Uh, but after the terrorist attacks of 2015, where several Jews were being killed simply for the fact of being Jewish, like none of them went out and were burning schools or, or libraries or rioting in any way. Right. There is the largest Southeast Asian community in Europe is in France, right? Uh, as far as we know, none of them participated in these, in these lootings and these riots. So this is a, an explosive mixture that has a very strong cultural element to it. Now, I know this is an uncomfortable topic, but the the problem is that we cannot ignore reality and then hope to come up with solutions. And I think so the first step is to say, okay, there is something very specific about certain groups that is, and I really want to stress this, it's cultural and not ethnic and not racial. And this is maybe what can give us a kind of a glimpse of hope because culture can change. So I don't think that all hope is lost, but first we have to name the problem. And certainly it has nothing to do with Islam or religion. Uh, The the common theme is said, oh, these are Muslim immigrants and this immigration group is a problem. And so I guess for those of us who want to uh, humanize everyone, we think, okay, well, is there something, is there some like thread of powerlessness running through that group that is making people like this act out in this way, Uh, you know, Is that a sensitive way to put it? Or I don't know what even what question I'm asking here is that like, what is the crux of of this uh, group and that they're asking for? No, I, th- I think the, you phrased the question perfectly. Uh, and this is, again, where we have to be be careful and honest about what we are facing. Uh, one is, and this is a little bit the narrative that's particularly popular on the left, is it's all economic, right? These people have been left behind. They have no economic opportunities. They have no material support. Therefore, they are desperate. And this is basically once there is a triggering event, like you mentioned before, the killing of the 17-year-old boy, once you have this triggering event, all this, this desperation bubbles over. Then you have the kind of right-wing narrative, which is it's all immigration. It's it's all Islam. It's, it's all a purely cultural factor. I think the reality is somewhere in between. And what I right. mean by this is there is a cultural component because we have one problem to different degrees in the West is we no longer have any convincing narrative to integrate people into, right? What does it mean to be French? What does it mean to be Swedish? What does it mean to be German? Because the Swedes have problems with gang and clan violence in Stockholm and Malmö. The Germans have these problems in in Berlin. And like neither Sweden nor Germany have a significant colonial history uh, in the Middle East or in North Africa. So the colonial narrative doesn't really work. So that's the one problem. And the, the other problem is, of course, then these people look for a form of identity. They look for, you know, a, a community experience. 
and they find it then in religion. They find it uh, in, in small acts of, of crime. So this is the problem. We have to think in the West, how can we offer something to integrate into? And that's the difficulty here. Right. And so some of these parallels that we see in the West is that this is a George Floyd moment for the West. We see now these French nationalists coming in to defend their cities. And I guess we would compare that to the far right in America defending their land. Um, these are like archetypes that we see sort of stamped out. Uh, it doesn't help for, you know, some Fortune 500 company to say, oh, but we stand for diversity and everything's okay. There's some kind of underlying inability um, of cultural assimil assimilation that we must we must acknowledge before we can think about how to fix, I guess. Is that an accurate uh, assessment? No, I think it's very accurate. Right? You, you cannot have a society without some degree of social cohesion. And if we look at the numbers, kind of what is available, basically it is true that the French state in many ways, they say it has turned its back on these on these areas, on these banlieues, on those, on those suburbs. But in many ways, they are simply too afraid to get into them, right? I think this is, of course, also very similar, as you mentioned, George Floyd in the US, right? Why police who does go into these areas has a, let's say, a looser trigger finger, and I'm not justifying it but of course because there's a completely different threat perception that is important because these are areas that are kind of divided up between you know drug dealers very very often between islamists between uh you know unstable homes so there, is, there are a lot of these elements that again a very uncomfortable topic but we have to face them this is replicated if we make the comparison with the african-american community in, in the united states there are some parallels there as well which nobody really wants to talk about right whether it's the city of chicago or whether it's the suburbs of um, uh, of Paris. So you have then this toxic combination of if police is there, there is the risk of clashes. But if no police is there, then of course, right. criminal and Islamists have free reign. And to find kind of a solution to this is very difficult. I think it is possible, but the way how you would do it, and this is, I think nobody dares to touch. You yeah. would have to run, and I say it careful, but I do mean it. And I think we kind of have to face up to this. It would have to be a program of almost brutal assimilation, right? You have to make sure that the kids go to school, right? You have to make sure that they don't descend into crime, that they don't descend into either criminal gangs or Islam gangs you have to make sure that you know that they 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 get work in the worst case wait one should even consider that you have work programs not for economic reasons but for social reasons integrate them into something give them you know public activities give them social activities where they have to work with french men and french women of other backgrounds you need to turn there's a very famous book uh, of French history about uh, turning peasants into Frenchmen that kind of tells the story of how the French evolved as a nation. And it's the same here. These people, many of them, by the way, who, held, who hold French passports, they need to be turned into, into Frenchmen. Otherwise, given the high percentage of foreign born you have in France and other parts of Europe, this is only going to get worse. And if I look at the reaction of the European, particularly French left, who is basically egging on these protests, which I think is an atrocious thing to do, yes. like the French left parties, uh, that's only going to make this worse. And I think they make the wrong bet because they think, oh, these people are then going to all vote for us. They won't because at some <laughs> point you're simply going to have immigrant parties. You're going to have Islamist parties. And that's then again going to make the situation so much more difficult. And that's where I see a strong parallel to the way the Democrats talk to the black community is like, oh, yes, you're so powerless. We speak for you. Don't worry. It's very patronizing. Um, and it's almost like they have no interest in actually uh, rising up the achievement levels of this population because, oh, you know, run along, little kid, we'll speak for you. Uh, that's not well, going to empower anybody. Well, if you just let me, allow me to add on something to this, because it's a wonderful point. It's really what is usually called the racism of low expectations. Because if you look again- I've never heard Southeast that Asian... term before. I'm going to write it down. That, I mean, well, yeah, that's, that's big. It. We see that in, with the Supreme Court ruling last week of affirmative action um, and these tweets that went viral, like, you're never going to succeed now. Poor dumb yeah. you. Uh, say it again. I'm going to write down the racism of low expectation. The racism of low expectations. And you see it also in France. But if you look, for example, of graduates from higher education institutions in France, right? Immigrants from Southeast Asia grade at a higher level than native French people, right? But they're also foreigners. And 
perspective about against whom they are racist and against, uh, against whom they are not racist. You see in the United States, right, some of the most successful individuals are people of Nigerian background, mm -hmm. of Indian background, of Asian background. So this narrative that, as you just correctly pointed out, right, so we tell one group of the population, whether it's Muslims in France, and even there's a difference between, let's say, Muslims from Iran, who usually do very well and Muslims, let's say from the Maghreb or from, from Algeria, which don't do so well. So there are these differences, but we pick one group and we want to keep them in permanent victim status. As you said, we want to tell them you can't do anything on your own. Everything is rigged against you. And I think that some groups without naming names, but some groups want to get political benefit out of this because the next sentence they say is you are too weak to speak for yourself. You are too weak to succeed on your own. So you need us to do it for you. And this yeah. is, a, a, I think, an insidious thing to do to these groups and to these people. Well, I can see one group already that's going to benefit from this, and that is the presidency of Emmanuel Macron, who has decided that social media must be censored uh, in a way that the French government was al already moving towards this. And this is a wonderful way to grab that power now. Um, can you speak to that and well, whether or not that will work and whether or not they're going to then give up that power? My guess is they won't. No, it's, it's the same trend you saw all over the West over the last years. Like you look at Donald Trump, right? Instead of engaging with why people voted for Donald Trump, we need to get him off Twitter. We need to get him off Facebook. You see the same in the in Germany with their right wing part of the Alternative for Deutschland, the Alternative for Germany, right? Instead of, of looking via about 20% of the population willing to vote for them, we have to start a new process to ban them. And now you see the same in France, right? Instead of talking about the problems, instead of talking about why these people turn violent, what the economic, cultural, social reasons are and how to address them, it is let's ban communication, right? Let, let's let's cramp down, let's clamp down on social media. It's, uh, it's the, the big attitude in the West is, instead of talking about the problem, let's ban, talk, let's ban talking about it. And that's of course, because it's not going to go away. And the most radical elements, not unjustif unjustifiably so, they will say, if what we have to say is so dangerous that they have to ban it, it must be true. And I have to admit, even though I don't share this attitude, they are forgiven to think so. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so where do you think this goes from here? We're just in Monday. The protests have raged over the weekend. Um, is there going to be Will there be any discussion or is it just a militant state from here on out? Well, we had a similar developments in 2005 and at some point it's gonna go down, kind of die down and then everybody's gonna move on as if nothing has happened when under the surface things are gonna deteriorate further. The solution, and this is again true for all of Europe, Europe needs at the moment, it needs, and this of course includes also Great Britain, it needs a moratorium on let's say culturally difficult to assimilate groups. I know this is a horrible thing to say, but it needs to assimilate the people who are here. It needs to assimilate its Muslim minority. It needs to assimilate those people who came in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an absolute necessity. And only if that is accomplished to an acceptable degree, we can once again talk about larger numbers of immigrants. But at the moment, we are way, way behind on, on integration. We're way behind on assimilation. Every commune in Europe, from Sweden to Germany to Austria to France, will tell you the same story. They're overstretched, they're underfunded, they don't have the schools, they don't have the social uh, the social institutions. We have another situation in Germany where public pools need private security services because they constantly have, have violence and gang fights, right? It's becoming more and more of a burden for average, including migrants, of course, for the average people who want to live a normal life. And yeah. then, of course, they start to sympathize with those groups who have a more radical agenda. And these groups are on the far right. But this is whoever fears the far right, right? The current policies will only strengthen them. So if you want to kind of take away their support, solve the problems, solve the issues they're talking about. They are not inventing them. I really want to stress this. The right wing, whether it's the true Finns, the Sweden Democrats, the Freedom Party in, in Austria, the AfD in Germany, the Front National or the Rassemblement National in, in, in France, Vox in Spain, Meloni in Italy, they are not inventing those problems. They are there, but they're the only ones who speak about them. And this is the reason why more and more people vote for them. Yeah, it's a simple question. How do people who are not alike live together? in a way that respects exactly. both groups like it's not a racist question it's a you know the, the same thing everybody it's, goes through when you get a roommate in college or what have you you know 
Yeah, um, and it's if you allow me this one this one concluding sentence, it's racist not to ask the question because then you implicitly say those people cannot be helped, they cannot change, they are just the way they are, which is the most racist. This is exactly what a racist would say. Right? Yes. The racist would say we cannot do anything to help these people because this is just how they are. It is how they will forever be. I don't believe this. I know that you don't believe it, but of course it's going to take work and it's also going to take certain pressure to to kind of make these cultural changes to turn these people, as I said, into Frenchmen, into Europeans on the right. long run. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for this. Uh, this was, you know, it's not you. a comfortable conversation, but I'm glad to have had it with you. Uh, where can people find you if they want to follow along with your analyze, uh, your analyst's work? I just Google my name. It's the easiest thing. I'm, I'm unfortunately uh, on every social media channel uh, and I, I, I try to have a very, very strong online presence for better or worse. So if you Google Ralph Schollhammer, you'll, you'll find basically all my writings uh, okay. uh, and everything I'm, I'm doing. All right. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.